Um, thank you. It's um, a great pleasure to be here. Um, thanks to um, Angus, who um, was uh, is responsible for me being here and responsible for me having uh, dipped my um, uh, academic fingers into vaccination for the past five years. Um, um, maybe a, a, a little bit of background. Um, I'm not an expert on vaccination. The, the reason we met at the very beginning was because my background is on the psychology of decision making. So how do people make decisions? How do they evaluate risks? Um, how do they communicate risks in any um, uh, context? And um, Angus um, and um, Christina, the time came to me and they said they, they had a, a, a questions that none of their epidemiologists and econometricians could answer, was what drives people to get vaccinated or to talk about vaccination in a positive light? And without making the history, um, a few years later, we ended up focusing on not just any people, but professionals and in particularly um, healthcare workers. So healthcare workers um, in, um, in England um, have a, um, oh, just starting with the case, that have um, received recommendations from the government that they should um, uh, take the flu vaccination. So the idea here is that immunization should be provided. So, sorry, this is the government's recommendation in uh, what they call the Green Book for Healthcare Workers. Immunization, immunization should be provided to healthcare and social care workers in direct contact with patients, clients, to protect them and reduce the transmission of influenza within health and social care premises to contribute to the uh, um, protection of individuals who may have sub a suboptimal response to, um, this is, um, my text is gone, but then I cannot, um, anyway, we get the, sorry, I've got a technical, um, don't take a picture of me. <laughs> 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 Anyway, sorry, um, you saved me there. Um, so the idea of this recommendation is um, three things, is that healthcare workers should be recommended, uh, should be vaccinated to, to protect themselves, to be able to stay at work, but also to protect um, the, the patients that they have in their care. Um, now 6.8%. Um, there's many uh, numbers you can use to kind of put your, your point across. This is not the number of healthcare workers who um, are vaccinated against the flu. Um, it's much higher than this, but it's the number of trust in, across the whole of England who actually meet the government target of having 75% of healthcare workers vaccinated. So the average is about 51% um, uh, across all trusts. But so that means that even in a, in a um, I understand discussing with some of you that not every country have official recommendation, but um, even when you have the official recommendation, you still have a, uh, an issue that not um, many people, many um, trust manage to reach that target. Now, where do I come in? Um, I come in as a, a behavioral scientist who looks at decisions. So maybe we can, I can use what we know from um, um, behavioral decision science to shed lights on what the issue is. And um, the classical approach from decision science or some um, behavioral insight we were mentioning earlier <coughs> is to think of people making decisions are uh, information processors. Sometimes you have read the terms informables. So we digest information. That's the way uh, most um, cognitive model of psychology would uh, portray us. And the idea of the dice is that we have risks in front of us, we have decisions to make, and the, the wills are um, what we're gonna do in our mind to process the information, and then voila, we're gonna have our opinion whether or not we will uh, decide to get vaccinated. Um, even though it's the main model in my field, I actually don't really like that model very much because I think that he's missing the point, and especially with the work um, that I did with Angus, the, when they came to me, they, they, 
came with this idea that information doesn't work. Um, we know now that maybe that's a strong argument, maybe it's not the type of information. But even if we think of a different type of information, we're still starting from the assumption that it's about weighing pros and cons. And maybe it is not just about that. Um, at home, we have this um, uh, little sentence. When, whenever someone wants to say, oh, you know, I really like to buy this, and we say, oh, need, 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 want, want, want. And it's just a reminder, I say, well, you know, do you really need this or do you want this? And I think there's something very basic about our decision making, that we might know what we should do, um, but we don't necessarily know, um, that doesn't necessarily match what we want to do. Um, and this is what we really want something. So, you know, imagine a healthcare worker who comes and says, I really want that flu shot um, for my patient. But more seriously, the, the work we did was coming from this angle. So say, well, if it's not just about information processing, what is it? What, how can we understand what makes healthcare workers want to be vaccinated? And so we um, developed a tool called Movac tool, which is using um, theories from um, business literature, not healthcare, not psychology, but actually business psychology um, interested in engagement. So maybe you've heard this, this is kind of a buzzword in management literature, where um, um, managers are very keen to understand what, what can they do to have engaged workers, people who are just happy to come to work, happy to work hard, and happy to do good for um, their organization. And um, I thought to apply that to vaccination with the sense that engagement is this idea that if you're engaged with something, you do it for four reasons. One, because you think it's valuable and important. Two, because you think that if you do it, it's going to make a difference. Otherwise, why bother? Three, because you kind of know what you're doing. Otherwise, you might think it's important, makes a difference. But if you don't know what you're doing, you might just stop there. And four, it's this idea of choice and, and um, uh, the idea that you do it because you want it, not because you've been told to do it. And to um, uh, give you some example, these four dimensions are measured uh, with um, traditional survey items. Um, for example, for value, um, people will be asked um, it is, uh, whether they agree with the statement, it is essential that I get the flu jab. Uh, for impact, an example is vaccination is a very effective way to protect me against the flu, so it makes a difference. Um, choice, um, whether or not I get the flu jab is entirely up to me. And an example for knowledge is um, I know very well how vaccination protects me from the flu. And using this tool, we um, engage in a series of um, Survey. So when I um, started to work, I didn't know that this is where I would be standing and um, where I would be, um, um, how, how we would evolve. But what happened is that with that tool, the um, reception was very positive because we managed to give information that seemed useful and everybody wanted to know um, uh, what was happening in their country. So we ended up running the surveys in many different countries. So here is just to give you an idea of the, of the process, um, the people involved, and um, then an idea of the samples that we've used so far um, with that survey. So um, the oldest surveys in Romania, um, these were, so maybe a note on the methodology. We used um, um, Sanofi's contact with a, a network called RAISE, which um, includes um, GPs who are motivated to promote flu vaccination. And um, every time the survey was uh, um, given to these contacts who then um, shared the surveys in their um, network. So it could be at a conference, it could be through an association. So this is opportunity sampling. Um, by making this um, um, presentation, when we stop to kind of look at the data, I realized that um, in all of these opportunity samples, uh, most of the respondents were female healthcare workers. It was not intentional. 
Um, but that's a, a question uh, that then raised, I've never you know, shared that with you, but why is it, because I don't think we have more, maybe more female nurse, but maybe not fe more female doctors. Um, so is there a case that we have a gender, so that's an open question, which I'm, I'm share with you. But anyway, the, these results apply to different countries and um, different type of healthcare workers, but mainly doctors or nurses. The biggest study that we did was with um, uh, Nick as well, with Imperial. The second one here, we have um, a, a big sample of, uh, that we did in the UK. And so just to give you an idea of the methodology, I will uh, present this result for this um, survey um, and to start with. So the, 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 the approach that we took was to say, well, we don't just have a, um, a survey when we say, well, you know, this dimension, ask whether this dimension predict vaccination. So then another thing that I don't like so much about the, my, my own field is this idea of the average person. So when we use quantitative methods, we um, make prediction of what predicts vaccination. And the assumption that we make is that whenever we give a survey to a thousand people, we are trained to study the average person. Um, and there is, um, it's an assumption that's rarely a question. And then you have the older extreme to say, well, you know, we need to focus on the qualitative individual case. But we could have something in the middle, which is to say, it's not the case that we're all so completely individual and different, but it's also not all uh, the case that we're all so um, similar. And when we face people in any samples, we might ask ourselves, and marketers have done that for a long time with consumers, we might ask ourselves, who is in our populations? Is everyone thinking the same? And if not everyone is thinking the same, who are the key typical groups of people? Um, and there are techniques now that you can use, uh, just take the data from the surveys and, and from the bottom up tells you, well, actually you have this group of people who tend to respond in a very similar ways to your questions. And they respond in a way that's very different from this other group of people. And when we run that analysis with the um, 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 survey data from the UK sample, what we found was that we had two clusters. One cluster we called the trustful um, was uh, scoring really high on all these dimensions. So they, they really agreed that vaccination was of value, that it was effective, um, they felt it was their choice to take the uh, vaccine and they felt very knowledgeable. And then there was another group that we called unconvinced because there, there appeared to be more on the middle. So they kind of did not quite agree that um, vaccination was of value or impactful. Um, they didn't feel so strongly that it was their choice and their knowledge was really neutral, um, just a little bit negative. So we have these two clusters that we've identified without asking them, you know, do you vaccinate or not? But we also had um, measures of the perception of risks and benefits. And you see that you have two different profiles among these people. The first one, um, they have a different beliefs about the severity of flu. Um, in their case, the, the first items was um, you know, how severe do you think you, the flu would be if you would get it? And they tend to agree that it would be quite severe. And if you compare with the, um, um, if, with the, uh, the flu severity, the absolute measure for the second group, you see that they're much less uh, convinced that the flu would be severe if they would get it. And again, on all this dimension, without going into details, you see that they show a different profile in terms of these beliefs. Usually in the standard um, social cognitive surveys, what you find is that that's all would, what you would measure and then you would try to see whether you can predict vaccination. But what you notice here is that we started from the, the idea of a motivation 
um, by looking at engagement with vaccination. And this then gives us different profiles of beliefs um, um, regarding vaccinations and um, flu severity. And now the big question is with these clusters, did we identify the people who vaccinate or not vaccinate? Are the people who are more engaged with vaccination more positive? Um, so we did ask them whether they'd vaccinated uh, the year before. Um, and then we have this uh, beautiful, uh, clear split so that um, among the people who were clustered as unconvinced, 73% um, had reported that they were not vaccinated. And among the, the group of people who were classified as trustful, 66% um, um, had reported that they were vaccinated. So the idea with this is that we can use the cluster then to propose intervention. So in this case, the approach would be, well, look, the issue um, is not there. You've got people who are vaccinated and they do it all for the right reason, but um, you've got a sample of people who's not quite um, convinced. And the main issue maybe is the first of all, they don't see the value of vaccination. So maybe the priority here for an intervention would be to focus on them understanding the value of vaccination before you get to any other um, uh, step to engage them more with, with vaccination. So we have a practical um, tool to help drive intervention. We haven't to this day succeeded in implementing intervention um, but we met uh, further down the line with um, Suzanne, who's, and then there's this idea that you can take this then to tailor the um, intervention. And then briefly, we tried to summarize. We did the same study across all um, these uh, countries. And the idea is how do you use this information then to communicate back to the um, um, uh, GPs or the people who want to promote vaccination. You know, what do we do with this? And um, here we're trying to have a better understanding of, you know, at the beginning I, I was talking about this average typical individual. So we always assume when we use a survey that we get this information about that one person. But when you do the cluster analysis before, you find out how many typical person you have in your sample. So um, in all the different countries, often we find two, but sometimes four, whom um, typical um, um, response to uh, engagement and vaccination. So here, this was um, in Kosovo. It was very interesting because the trustful category, you see that they score high on autonomy, on knowledge, impact, and value. But knowledge, they were split in two, so they're they felt like they knew about vaccination, but not really about what vaccination was doing to their body. So there was a specific question about knowledge that kind of stood out for them. But they didn't care that they didn't know what the vaccine was doing to their body. They were vaccinated. But there, there was another group who um, we called the trusted um, expert, and these groups was not vaccinated. But they scored very high on autonomy. They felt it was their choice. Um, they felt that they, re they knew exactly what the vaccine was doing to their body. They knew about vaccination. They felt it was impactful, but they didn't think it was as valuable as the other. So that means that with this approach, you, you have an un a deeper understanding of who are your vaccinators and who are your non-vaccinators, and where are the trigger that you can try to um, push to try and bring them back uh, on the other side. Here, the, the picture is quite positive, um, except that maybe the autonomy is what drives the decision not to uh, vaccinate. Um, because I know that the time will be short, so I, I know I cannot get you through all these countries. Um, but very quickly, just an idea that if you glance quickly at this um, little um, graph at the bottom, I just put those people who are not vaccinated in um, the cluster that we found in other countries. And you see that this, for various reasons in terms of their engagement. Um, um, here, uh, we are in Bulgaria. Um, they are less, uh, those who don't vaccinate, they're quite positive, but still they decide not to, um, to vaccinate. 
And then each time you can compare the difference between those who don't vaccinate and those who vaccinate. I'm only showing you a little bit of information there to give you an idea of, of how um, different people decide to vaccinate or not vaccinate for different reasons. Um, just a couple of slides. I can see that I'm eating in my, just I've got two minutes, two slides. Where do we go from there? So we've got a tool um, that changes the perspective, not just in terms of what are people's beliefs about risks and benefits, but rather what is driving people to decide, and not just people, I should say, healthcare workers, to decide to get uh, vaccinated against the flu. And what's our contribution back to research? The idea that um, perhaps until now, healthcare workers' decisions have just been conceived as a similar health decision that they would be for anyone who wants to get the flu shot. But I think there is a bigger issue for this particular population, is that when they decide to get a flu shot, it's not just for their own health. It could be because the government says they should, their boss said they should, the patient needs them to take the vaccine. And if you think about it in terms of a, 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 an organizational um, management um, issue, you know, what other job asks you to do something so personal as having a vaccine for your job? Because that's, that's what they're, you know, they're asked to do, to do so. So future research, we need to identify all the drivers of these decisions for these people, not just their, their beliefs about risk and benefits, and then try and understand how we can monitor their engagement and um, have tailored, I've heard this a lot, and I think I'm so on board with that agenda that we need to move on from a one size fits all approach to a tailored approach, even for this um, population. And I finished with my three tweets because I could not tweet while I was speaking. So <laughs> here they are.